Hello everyone, thanks for coming, we should get started. Um, we're trying something a bit different today. Uh, Edward Snowden has us linked in directly to the Russian embassy, <laughs> also known as Varsity Drive. So actually we're being live, uh, sent live to Varsity Drive, hope you can see us. And they're going to come in and help us ask questions later. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Jacob Algayer. And Jacob is visiting with us. He's a, a candidate for our open position in ecosystem ecology. Tell you a wee bit about Jake. He did an undergraduate degree at uh, in uh, no, that's a postdoc. Wait a minute, a BS at the Center College in Danville, Kentucky. In the center of Kentucky. Yeah, <laughs> there's just a trace. You know how I have a Georgia accent. You can just hear <laughs> the trace of a Kentucky accent here. From there, he went uh, to do a PhD at the University of Georgia with Amy Roseman. From there, a postdoctoral research position at NC State, and that's where he started to work with uh, uh, Craig Lehman. Uh, from there, a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow at the University of Washington, working with uh, Dan Schindler, and then uh, most recently a postdoctoral research associate at Santa Barbara, and I believe Devin Burkpile is uh, the primary collaborator there. Jacob works primarily in marine systems, primarily in, 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 uh, with, with the role of fish as units of storage and excretion of nutrients and how that influences ecosystem processes. He's published in all the wonderful places we might imagine, Nature Communications and PNES and Ecology Letters and so on, uh, with a wonderful publication list. Uh, as impressive, he's done a lot of outreach work in some difficult parts of the world, most recently in Haiti, so I think he's been watching the recent weather forecast with some trepidation. We've done a lot of uh, outreach work there with, with students and members of the public, and has been involved in setting up marine reserves, three in the Bahamas. So I don't want to take up any of his time. I'm just going to leave you with the title of the seminar, which is just up there. Jake. Thank you very much. So I'd like to first um, start to say it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, it's an honor to be interviewing for this position. It'd be, uh, this is an amazing department and an amazing university. It'd be a really fantastic place to end up. So one of the long-standing questions in ecology is, what are the fundamental pro processes that underlie how ecosystems are structured? More specifically, what are the processes that underlie the patterns that we see emerge both within and across ecosystems? So a classic example of this are these Namibian fairy circles that we see in the deserts of Africa, whereby we see these sort of concentric circles being formed by vegetation that emerge across the landscape in a seemingly non-random way. And we see these types of patterns emerge. See these types of patterns emerge across many different ecosystem types. This is another desert landscape in the southwestern United States. That feedback's pretty bad. Did that? How am I? How's my voice and my volume? So it's going to be lower than the time. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, thanks. Feedback on this one. How's that? Okay, thanks. Um, we see similar patterns emerge um, in these desert landscapes in the southwestern United States, where we have these sort of mosaic between the vegetation and the sand, again forming these seemingly non random patterns. And then in systems more closely related to what I'll be speaking with you all today about, and more closely related to my research. This is a patch reef complex uh, on a coastal shelf in the Pacific tropical waters. And if we sort of zoom in on one of these patch reefs, we see that there are sort of nodes of heightened ecological interaction, whereby we get these feedback dynamics occurring between habitat characteristics, consumer behavior, and ecosystem function. And as we zoom away from these, we see that these nodes then are connected, particularly by the behavior of the consumers within these ecosystems. And it's really the diversity of that behavior, both within species, but also among species, that may be critical in helping us understand how these processes emerge, or these patterns emerge across these ecosystems. Thank you. So one of the fundamental questions of my research program is, what are the mechanistic drivers of ecological feedbacks? And then how are these feedbacks then linked spatially across ecosystems? And I address this question largely through trying to understand um, aspects of energy and nutrient flow. And nutrients represent a really useful common currency with which we can quantify ecological interactions, both 
biotic, but as well as abiotic. And within this framework, I really span across a broad, um, broad breadth of the subdisciplines within our field, ranging from population, community ecology, to ecosystem ecology, to landscape ecology. And using this framework, I can link my research directly into some of the leading uh, conservation questions within uh, ecology, ranging from issues associated with habitat degradation, consumer exploitation, and nutrient pollution or eutrophication. And so my more recent work, I'm conducting some work in climate change. And so in this way, my research is very much rooted in ecological theory, but it's also very much motivated by conservation. So most of my work takes place in tropical and subtropical coastal ecosystems, ranging from mangrove ecosystems to seagrass beds to coral reefs, um, taking place largely in the Caribbean, but I've also started some recent work in the Pacific. And these are really fascinating systems to work in for many different reasons. But among those reasons is because literally hundreds of millions of people subside directly on the services provided by these systems, ranging from the obvious services such as uh, fisheries production to more cryptic services such as uh, storm protection. So we saw a lot of storms come recently hitting the Caribbean, actually currently right now. And a lot of the reasons why some of those storms could be bad is because of the degradation of the coral reefs associated with these systems. But then also on these larger global cycles, we see really important storage of carbon within many of these ecosystems, particularly mangroves and seagrass beds. But these, these ecosystems are also largely impaired. So this is a slide that um, Halpern and colleagues produced showing where in the global oceans humans are having the largest impact. It's essentially a heat map of the global oceans, and the areas in red are where there's the largest impact. And I like this slide because they highlight the fact that the Caribbean is really one of the regions that are most impacted throughout the world. And they point out the fact that overfishing and eutrophication are two of the leading causes for this degradation. And that's two components of where my, or two aspects of my research focuses. But I also want to point out that there's some areas within this region that are light blue, indicating that there's still some really healthy regions within these systems, which provides us a really useful ecological or environmental gradient or sort of a um, a contrast with which to ask really interesting ecological questions, but also tie those directly into conservation issues. These systems are also really interesting for ecology because they're so biodiverse. And through the perspectives of nutrient dynamics, we can look at that diversity and the species in these communities as essentially having unique roles in the storage and cycling of nutrients. And then we can think about how those species then assemble at the community level and then how that may be critical for driving ecosystem level processes of storage, but also supply of nutrients to these ecosystems. And then this, this sort of framework can then be used to understand how anthropogenic stressors are altering these processes. So in this case, fishing pressure is removing certain species or certain body sizes, which fundamentally changes how these communities both store and recycle nutrients back to the environment. So a lot of this research um, with respect to the role of consumers in mediating these nutrient dynamics has been well studied um, in ecology, both terrestrial and freshwater systems. And in the early 80s, Judy Meyer conducted a really phenomenal study um, where she showed the importance of this for coral reef ecosystems. And basically what she showed was that grunts, this species here, aggregating around a single coral head enhanced the growth of that coral by 70% relative to coral adjacent to it with no fish aggregating around it. And this makes a lot of sense in terms of the fact that these systems are extremely nutrient poor, so the role of consumers in providing these nutrients could be particularly important. And in fact, some of my earlier research has shown that some of the ecosystems in the Bahamas are among the most nutrient poor marine ecosystems recorded. But it also makes a lot of sense that this could be an important role because the consumers represent a huge proportion of biomass in these systems. And some of our more recent work has shown that fishes are in fact among the largest sources of nutrients to coral reef ecosystems. But despite the fact that a lot of this has been well studied in many of these uh, terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems, it really hasn't been well studied um, since Judy Meyer produced that paper in these coastal benthic systems, particularly in the tropics. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing recently and some of my colleagues is really at the leading edge of sort of re-interjecting these ideas into coastal marine um, ecology. And we recently wrote a paper we titled Animal P in the Sea, Consumer Mediated Nutrient Dynamics in the World's Oceans. And this is a review paper, and the goal is to essentially create a sort of synthetic framework with which to begin to interject these ideas into our understanding of how these ecosystems function, both in terms of the ecology, but also in terms of the conservation aspects. 
And we largely frame uh, or structure our um, research around sort of a mass balance approach, ranging from the, the resource, the donor, and the recipient. And today I'm going to sort of talk about more on the right side of this equation, whereby fishes are providing a lot of these really important nutrients, and that's affecting the, um, the recipient being either seagrasses or coral. So today I'll be talking about some of my research I've been conducting, trying to essentially address what are drivers of feedback dynamics across multiple spatial scales and gradients of human change. And I'm going to use this um, diagram to structure my talk. I'm first going to talk about some of my more experimental research using artificial reefs, trying to ask questions about how feedback dynamics can really be initiated at the habitat scale. I'm then going to sort of take a step back and ask questions about the role of community structure in driving these ecosystem processes at larger spatial scales, at the ecosystem scale and even regional scale. And then I'm going to sort of look forward a little bit clickers, um, and talk about some of the work I'm conducting for my uh, postdoctoral research, but also some future directions of my research, trying to understand the role of consumer behavior in mediating or linking these processes spatially. So jumping into the artificial reef research. So this work was, again, very much motivated by that study um, by Judy Meyer, where fishes are aggregating around a central area and sort of enhancing localized ecosystem processes. But our idea was to, to build some sort of structure, in this case we use cinder blocks, and seagrass beds, um, with the idea that could enhance local processes and we could measure those. And essentially create a feedback loop whereby we build the structure, Fishes aggregate around the structure. They supply nutrients locally, which, which then in turn enhance the production of the seagrass around these reefs, which then enhances uh, food resources, but also habitat for local invertebrates, and feedbacks potentially on the fish community, potentially enhancing production of these higher trophic levels. And we hypothesized that this feedback would create sort of a biogeochemical hotspot within the greater seascape. But to test this, we knew we, needed, we knew we needed to be able to estimate the amount of nutrients that fishes were supplying to the local environment. And so I spent a sort of embarrassingly a large amount of time measuring fish pee. I actually became known as the fish pee guy on the island I was working on in the Bahamas. But the idea is simple. You catch a fish, you put it in a bag, you measure the nutrients um, before you put the fish in the bag and after, and the difference tells you how much that fish is releasing per unit time. And so I did this for a really large number of species of fish, some 76 species of fish, 62 species of invertebrates, and literally hundreds upon hundreds of individuals. And so and for each individual, I measured both the excretion rate, but also measured the amount of nutrients they're storing in their tissue. So this also wasn't a very glamorous thing, because this meant I had to unfortunately kill all these fish and put them into blenders, including a four foot more a eel. Um, and measure the and subsample their tissue and measure the nutrients in their tissue. But because there are some potential methodological issues associated with putting a fish in a bag, I underpinned these empirical data um, using bioenergetics models and a Bayesian framework. And I'm not going to explain the details of how I did that. Um, I'd be happy to talk about, about it with anyone afterwards. But essentially what that did was it provided us with models that allowed us to go to any coastal ecosystem in the Caribbean and given knowledge of what species were there and their relative body size, we could then estimate at an individual or a community level um, how much nutrients that community was storing and then recycling back to the local environment. So again, back to these artificial reefs, the idea is that we would build this structure out of cinder blocks, fishes would, uh, would, okay. fishes would aggregate around that structure. We could use visual surveys over time to figure out who was there and what their relative body sizes were. We could use those models that I just described to estimate how much they're then recycling back to the local environment. And then we can measure the effect. Sorry about that. This clicker is not doing me justice. We could then measure the effect of the seagrass community around that. And so, <laughs> sorry, you all. I don't think I have that heavy of a thumb. All right, I want this video to work, so I'm going to try it. I'm glad I clicked it, and this isn't going to delay. All right, there's the video. Um, so the idea was we wanted to um, create 
create communities of fish at different sizes. And so the way we did this was we built a series of artificial reefs at different sizes, ranging from 40 center blocks to 10 center blocks to zero center blocks. And these are all built, these are all built in about three to four meters in a continuous seagrass bed in the Bahamas. And I like this video because it really shows you that the reefs work in terms of fish aggregating around them at pretty high densities, but also at pretty decent diversity. There's probably about 12 to 15 uh, species of fish in that video. And so what we found from that was a, was a really, really nice, clean ecological field data whereby the more fish you get, the more nutrient supply you get from the fish. So that here's nitrogen and phosphorus supply on the x-axis. And the more nitrogen and phosphorus you have, the more growth of the dominant seagrass. This is uh, measured by uh, uh, the growth rate of the Thalassia testidum, the turtle grass within this area, the more, the more growth rate you have. So a, a nice, clean, positive relationship um, which is, again, nice to see from sort of real ecological field data. Man. Sorry, you All right. Um, but we also found support for this idea that it could create these biogeochemical hotspots within the greater seascape. And the way we decided to measure this was we would measure certain traits of the seagrass as a function of distance away from the reef. So you can see here on the x-axis, this is distance from reef. And on the y-axis, we have percent phosphorus and percent nitrogen in the seagrass, which is essentially a proxy for the ambient availability of nutrients for the seagrass. And the different colors represent the different reefs, but for the purpose of this talk, you can just think about the red and the green as being the reefs with the most fish. And what you can see is this, these nice, negative, at times nonlinear relationships whereby the further you get from the reef, the, least, the, the decrease of an effect the fish excretion is having on the seagrass. So just to provide a, a visual of that, you can see that we can essentially delineate the extent to which these biogeochemical hotspots are extending into the seagrass. And we've actually identified the mechanism by which this occurs, whereby the seagrass um, is taking up the nutrients through its blades, but immediately shunting those nutrients into its roots until it hits a certain point at which the roots are saturated with those nutrients. At that point, it begins to increase above ground growth. So we're actually seeing the extent of this biogeochemical hotspot extend out from the reef over time until we expect another, another threshold to be reached whereby there's simply not enough nutrients from the fish to reach those seagrass uh, at a, that certain extent. So essentially we're developing a pretty good understanding of sort of the mechanisms associated with this production around these reefs. And basically where you have more fishes, you have more nutrients, you have more seagrass production. But this leads to the idea that where you have fishing and removal of these fish, you may have reduced production. But we know that where you have fishing, you have more humans. Where you have more humans, you typically have more anthropogenic nutrients going uh, into these areas. So that leads to an interesting question. Can the nutrient pollution supplant the loss of nutrients from fishing pressure? And this I find to be a really fascinating question. And it was, that, in fact, first um, asked of us when we were giving local uh, meetings to local fishers in the Bahamas. And it really highlights the fact that these people understand their system quite well. Um, and at first, uh, and at first we, um, we didn't really have a good answer for it, but we re I realized that the answer is likely no because the ratio of these sources are quite different. So sewage typically is, is enriched in phosphorus relative to nitrogen, so it has a low ratio, whereas fish excretion typically has more nitrogen relative to phosphorus. Uh, and so it essentially leads to this hypothesis that due to these different ratios of these sources, you may have differential effects on the benthic community. So this is ultimately rooted in the, in the resource ratio hypothesis. And so just to sort of give you all a little refresher, the idea here is relatively simple, is that when you have two different resources, so in this case, we have nitrogen availability and phosphorus availability, under certain scenarios of these uh, resources, you may have some species may do particularly well. Under other scenarios of these resources, other species may do particularly well. But it's this area where, where these species overlap where you'll have heightened ecological competition, um, and that can lead to, to differential responses in these benefit communities. So we're currently testing this question in two different ways. The first way is, um, through a project that was funded by an EPA star fellowship as well as an NSF DIG grant. Um, and the idea here was to build a new series of artificial reefs and manipulate it to simulate the effects of nutrient pollution and fishing pressure. 
And the way I did this was to build these diffusers that I filled with a slow release fertilizer that was at a very low N to P ratio, simulating sewage, that we would then replace over time, every few months. And then to simulate fishing pressure, we simply manipulated the habitat of the reef itself by filling in the holes of the center block, essentially reducing the complexity, which may sound like it may not have that great of an effect, but it actually reduced the fish biomass around these reefs by about 75%. And it also changed the structure of these fish communities <coughs> to really mimic the reefs that we see in Haiti where the fish communities are extremely overfished. So this was a full factorial design and it's a long-term fertilization project. We've been maintaining these fertilization projects or this, the fertilization on these reefs for up to six years now. Now I'm about to show you some data from, uh, that we took a few years ago where we were interested in how these different uh, ratios of nutrient supply would affect the, the benthic seagrass community around these reefs. So essentially, we were interested in understanding how it would affect both the richness, but also the evenness of these communities as a function of distance away from the reef. So each of these lines represents a different treatment. The gray is the control. The uh, dark blue is the fertilizer treatment. The light blue is the fishing treatment. And then the red is the interaction. And I don't, these are um, general additive models. I'm not going to get into the stats of it. And I don't have the data points on it just for clarity for this. Um, Talk. But what you can see with respect to riches is that we didn't see a whole lot of change. Basically, only in the case where there was fishing pressure, presumably due to um, reduced grazing, did we see any increase in number of species present around these reefs. But we did see subsist substantial change occur due um, with respect to the, the structure of this community, whereby under every scenario of, of nutrient supply ratio, we saw changes in the evenness of these communities. And what's more interesting is that this, the interaction is synergistic. And so the interaction of fishing pressure and nutrient pollution has some clear important implications for the structure of these seagrass communities. But what's, what's again interesting about this is that it's in, it's in a synergistic way such that it's not predictable based on knowledge of what occurs to seagrass community due to fishing alone or nutrient pollution alone. So this is a sort of, um, a, we're continuing <laughs> studies around these reefs over time to monitor how they may be changing. So the second test of this hypothesis of the effect of different ratios of nutrient supply on the seagrass communities, um, we're doing, instead of manipulating reefs to um, simulate these stressors, we decided to take advantage of this sort of gradient that I talked about earlier that exists throughout the Caribbean, whereby you have extreme fishing pressure and nutrient pollution. And this is a project that was funded by an NSF grant that I co-wrote with Craig Lehman, who's a, a collaborator on really all of this artificial reef research. And just to highlight the gradient that exists across the Caribbean in terms of fishing pressure, these are two reefs we built a few years ago. This reef on top we built on Andros Island, which is this star here. And there's literally over a thousand fish on this reef. It's, it's actually hard to see the reef sometimes. There's so many fish. This represents one of the areas that's most um, unimpacted throughout the entire Caribbean. And in sharp contrast, we have this reef, which is in Haiti down here, where there's very few fish on it at all. So that represents a really extreme gradient of fishing pressure, but within each of these areas, we also span a gradient of, of nutrient pollution. And so in this project, we have 25 different sites across two different regions. Uh, it's a long-term study. We're currently in the third year, so I don't have any data, unfortunately, to show you all right now. But what's cool about this project is that um, both in terms of ecology, we were able to ask some really interesting questions, and in particular, we can pair it with those sort of more manipulative um, mechanistic studies with artificial reefs that I just explained. But we're also using it as an opportunity to really integrate our science into conservation. Um, so Craig and I uh, were first brought down to Haiti about four years ago to provide scientific recommendations of areas that are highest priority for, for conservation, which in turn was used to establish the first marine protected area. So we've been working with the Nature Conservancy and UNEP uh, over the course of time providing some recommendations to help uh, implement and manage this first marine protected area. But in addition to this, we work very closely with the local communities uh, within this research area. So before we start a project, we go around the local community members, um, speak with community leaders, school children, and, and fishers in particular, and provide background about both the research project that we're conducting, but also just a little bit of background about the ecology within the system. So I've made a, 
a few of these um, posters that just provide a little bit of education that you can now see posted up throughout the schools in this region. And then we work directly with them to actually build these wreaths. So this is particularly fun. It's often sometimes a little scary because we, we literally go out in these handmade sailboats with no motor by sail filled with thousands of pounds of cinder blocks. And they keep wanting to put more blocks in these things. And I'm like, that's enough, that's enough. And then we, we go out in the middle of the ocean, we dump these blocks over and we build these reefs. And these fishers and these communities are really starting to see potential advantages to working with us on these reefs. And they're very excited about this potential, this, this potential to the degree that we're now working with a local community where we've built a network of reefs that they've agreed to not fish on some and actually fish on others. So this provides a good example of where we're actually bridging really interesting science with conservation. And so I bring this up now because I want to highlight the fact that this is very integral to my research program and by no means is this an afterthought. And we're developing a really um, strong support group or infrastructure in Haiti to where we can start beginning to ask really interesting and integral questions such as how do we integrate ecology and human behavior to really improve conservation on marine protected area designs. And I think we've got a lot of opportunity within this system to move forward on these really big questions. It's, it's a really exciting avenue of research um, for me. All right, so uh, moving forward and asking um, questions about the role of community dynamics for ecosystem processes. So I mentioned that these ecosystems are extremely biodiverse and then that we can use sort of the lens of nutrient dynamics to try to understand the, um, how communities assemble um, to create ecosystem scale, um, to, to ecosystem scale ecosystem function. But I wanna again highlight the fact that these, these ecosystem functions of the storage and the supply of nutrients are extremely important in these hypernutrient limited systems. Fish is again represent a huge proportion of biomass within these ecosystems, and that turn represent a huge proportion of the nutrients that are stored within these systems and then supplied back to these ecosystems. And so this provides a really awesome context with which to ask very basic questions about the importance of biodiversity for ecosystem function and ecosystems that are um, extremely impaired but also extremely species rich. So my first sort of foray into this was through a collaboration with Peter Mummy, who's an Australian researcher, um, Australian coral reef researcher. And he collected this tremendous data set of fish surveys throughout the Northern Caribbean, uh, ranging across seven different islands, some 172 fish communities, and thousands of individual fish, and um, six different ecosystem types. So four types of coral reef, seagrass beds, and mangrove ecosystems. And what is unique about this Data set is they also intentionally selected systems that were relatively unimpacted. So this is sort of represents to some degree somewhat of a baseline of what these fish communities look like without being heavily impaired. We then use these data to and then merge them with the model that I explained to you earlier to estimate how much each individual within these, these data sets were supplying nitrogen and phosphorus and storing nutrients so we could estimate at the community or ecosystem level how much these communities are supplying or storing these nutrients. And we were able to count for 144 species and 99% of the biomass within this data set. And again, the goal here was to be able to try to figure out what attributes of these communities best predict how the communities um, supply or store nutrients to these ecosystems. So I used a series of hierarchical mixed effects models but um, with respect to what we found, really one of the most important findings was this alone. It's, this is just the log of this number of species within a given community against the log of the nitrogen supply. And you can really supplant any of the ecosystem function within that, that axis. And what you can see is this is just a linear model, not, not hierarchical, not, no random effects. You can see an extremely strong relationship whereby richness was by far the best predictor of the community to explain how that community would either supply or store these nutrients. So this provides really strong support for um, the importance of biodiversity for these ecosystems as well as biodiversity theory and again a really species rich ecosystem and across a large spatial gradient. But as I mentioned these are relatively healthy fish community and I was interested in trying to understand how they would respond to some, some sort of perturbation. And so I conducted a series of simulations whereby we simulated a series of um, 
a series of conditions of species loss to understand which of the attributes of the communities would best help these communities maintain these ecosystem functions. And what we found was that, um, if it comes up, that species identity and biomass were extremely important in helping these communities maintain these processes. But oddly enough, and to my surprise, trophic structure with respect to these simulations didn't emerge to be particularly important. But I was interested in pursuing this question and asking how these processes were then, were then changed by, by, by real stressors, and um, specifically fishing pressure across the Caribbean. So to address this question, I collaborated with Abel Valdivi and Courtney Cox, who at the time were researchers at the University of North Carolina. And they conducted another really phenomenal um, data set of surveys across the entire Caribbean, but this time taking advantage of that gradient, of that informative contrast of fishing pressure, whereby they went to half of their sites for areas that were protected um, as marine protected areas for at least 18 years, and half of the sites represented some gradient of fishing pressure ranging from heavily commercially fished to subsistence fished. And this was conducted across five different countries, um, 43 different reefs uh, that were monitored over the series of a few years. And so what we found was relatively intuitive in the sense that where you have more fishing, you have more removal of biomass, and that reduces how these communities can supply or store these nutrients. So what we have here on the x-axis is a log of the population density nearest to a given reef. And on the y-axis, we again have the log of the nitrogen supply. But again, you can essentially um, transplant any of the ecosystem <coughs> functions on that axis, and you get a very similar relationship. Each point on this plot represents a different coral reef. The dark green points represent reefs that are um, protected from fishing pressure. And what you can see is a, a pretty strong negative relationship, again, where you have more humans fishing, you have a reduction in these processes. And this becomes even more pronounced when you look at it in terms of just a binary, whereby you see fishing pressure reduces these processes by nearly 50%. That's a pretty huge reduction in the amount of nutrients that these communities are both storing, but also supplying to these ecosystems that are, again, extremely nutrient poor. So, well, so um, based on what we found previously in biodiversity theory in general, you would expect, given such a really substantial reduction in ecosystem function, you would also see substantial losses in the number of species within these communities. That's not exactly what we found. So if you look at the communities, so these are violin plots, they're basically kind of like two-sided distributions. Um, if you look at the communities without including the top, the top predators or the piscivores, you see no actual significant difference in the number of species when you have communities that are fished versus those that are not fished. When you add in the piscivores, you do see some, some significant differences emerge. But the key here is that it's, it's showing that, that fishers are very selectively harvesting these top-level predators, and that's having the effect on the number of species within these communities, but they're really not affecting the sort of the vast majority of the species within these communities. And this is supported by the fact that if you look at the three parameters that best predict how these communities supply or store nutrients, um, trophic level, the biomass of the communities, and the richness, you can see that trophic level was by far changed more than biomass or richness due to the effect of fishing pressure. And so again, what this is saying is that selective harvest of these higher trophic levels is a really key driver of these reduced nutrient processes. So, Again, where we have more humans, we have reduced fish-mediated nutrients. But as I mentioned earlier, where you, have, where you have more humans, you have increases in the nutrients made available by humans, particularly with respect to sewage. And so this brings us back to that question, can these anthropogenic, anthropogenic nutrients supplant the loss of nutrients from fishing pressure? And so we know that sewage is typically low, uh, high in phosphorus relative to nitrogen, so it has a low into P ratio. But at this point, we really don't know what these coral reef fish communities are supplying in terms of their ratio at the community level. So I went back to this data set where they, they, had sent, they surveyed communities that, again, are relatively unimpacted to ask this question, what ratio are these communities supplying nutrients at? And so on the x-axis, we have the different communities, and each point represents the ratio, ranging from a low ratio with more phosphorus to a higher ratio with more nitrogen. Um, that the entire community is supplying these nutrients. 
and each color represents a different ecosystem type. But I want to highlight these first four colors. The average number hovers around 20 to 1 ratio. And so this is 122 different fish communities ranging across a really large geographic span, ranging substantially in biomass, species richness, and trophic level, but yet they're excreting nutrients at a very consistent ratio around 20 to 1. And this is really striking to me. Um, and so I wanted to look further in the ecological literature to try to figure out some, re some reason why this may be significant. Oh, it's not. It's on. I guess the battery died. Uh, just keep going. <laughs> just keep going. <laughs> All right. Um, so I looked into the literature where researchers had manipulated uh, the nutrient environment for coral to see how coral responded. Basically, if the coral did well, grew more, or died. And um, I'm going to plot those studies on this axis. Again, it's ranging from uh, low ratio with more phosphorus to high ratio with more nitrogen. And if you look at the studies where they found negative coral fitness, in essence, every one of these studies but one, the coral died, you can see that the researchers manipulated the environment with a really low ratio or a really high ratio. But if you look at the studies where the coral did well, it's sort of bracketed and sitting right in the middle. So this is indicative that the coral have a sort of sweet spot of nutrient ratio where they do best, which again is sort of supported by that idea of the, the resource ratio hypothesis. But what's even cooler is if you overlay the ratios that these fish communities are supplying to these ecosystems, you see a really strong overlap. And this is obviously not mechanistic, but it's very strongly suggestive of the idea that coral are supplying nutrients at an ecosystem scale at this sort of optimal ratio for coral to best thrive. So essentially for their habitat that they're living in. And so we're now starting to test questions around this idea, again, using those reefs that we're manipulating, we're manipulating with um, nutrient pollution to simulate nutrient pollution and fishing pressure, but this time hanging coral around those reefs. And so we've got, again, a factorial design with 128 coral fragments of, of two different species that grow very different. And the experiment lasted for about a year. So this is a video um, where this is the reef. And it, I, I constructed this PVC sort of tent where we suspend the coral from the PVC. And the coral is receiving all those nutrients from the fish and then also from the fertilizer that's surrounding the reefs, so a, a reef that doesn't actually get fertilizer. And so we actually just pulled these samples a few months ago. And I'm working with a coral physiologist um, now to start testing uh, aspects about the coral to see how it performed under these different scenarios of nutrient ratios. So we're really excited about the opportunities we have with these reefs to continue to build new projects because we have such a nice experimental design already in place. All right, so now I'm going to shift directions and talk about a little bit of the work I'm doing now, but also some directions where um, I'd like to pursue given a position within this department. So Essentially, I've showed you that habitat structure can, can really create these biogeochemical hotspots and enhance these localized ecosystem processes. And that at the ecosystem scale, biodiversity is clearly important, but community size, size structure is really a key driver of nutrient dynamics, particularly in the context of fishing pressure. And then there's this really interesting potential relationship between the ratio of nutrient supply at the ecosystem level and that that's taken up by the coral and what's most optimal for coral that we need to really continue to pursue. But, well, but how do these processes interact across the landscape through the behavior of consumers is a really big question that I'm really excited about continuing to pursue. So the way that communities interact spatially across landscapes has been well studied um, in the context of meta-community theory. More recently, researchers have been interested in extending upon those sort of species-species interactions, understanding about the flux of energy and nutrients and how that may be affecting habitat characteristics within the context of meta-ecosystems theory. And so a lot of the work I've been talking today about has been building on some of these aspects and trying to develop understanding of these feedbacks, but it's really missing understanding about the role that consumers play in mediating these feedbacks, both in terms of my work, but also in terms of larger context of Meta ecosystems theory. So I'm going to sort of provide a little example of why this might matter with respect to this system. So if we think about these four nodes across this landscape, and we're interested how they're spatially connected by a population of fishes, we may think about that in terms of some uh, frequency distribution of some trait 
uh, with respect to the individuals in that population. So in this case, Trey we're interested in is the distance that the individuals are moved and how they're connecting these, um, these nodes. It's very common to think about then the individuals within that population is sort of following that similar distribution. And so in this case, we have the different colors represent different individuals, and essentially all the individuals are doing basically the same thing. But we know in ecology in real life that that's not always the case. And in fact, there's a lot of really great research coming out now showing that it isn't the case. And in that sense, for, with respect to nutrient dynamics, that could be particularly important to know because you could have some in individuals that have disproportionate effects on these processes. So in this case, we have the orange individual that moves substantially more than the blue or the red individual. In that case, the orange individual has a disproportionate effect on the movement of these nutrients or energy in linking these, these processes spatially. And so some of the research, uh -oh. well, there's supposed to be bars there. I guess it's the PC <laughs> thing. Um, so some of the research that I've been conducting for my postdoctoral work is trying to address these questions exactly. Um, using a series of data sets. So one data set I'm working with is of Salmonid movement in the Pacific Northwest, trying to um, identify variation of, among individuals and see if we can use that as a tool to test river restoration. Another data set that I'm using is something that I collected many years ago uh, using telemetry to monitor the movement of snapper within a mangrove estuary. And um, an example of how variable the behavior is, this, this axis represents a sort of metric of specialization and movement behavior, where the lower the value represents uh, a more specialized individual. And you can see for both of these populations, there's a, a strong gradient across which there are many individuals that are highly specialized, but there are also many individuals that are, are generalist and, and sort of mimic that population curve. And that contrasts very strongly with what we predict based on simulations that are based on sort of theoretical expectations of what a specialist or a generalist population would look like. And so this is suggesting that um, theory does a relatively poor job at predicting what we actually find occurring in the wild. And so this leads to a really important question. What's the role of variation in consumer behavior among and within species for linking these feedbacks across these spatial scales? So this is sort of the focus of the first big grant that I would, um, I would write given a position within this department. And over the last 10 years, Craig Lehman and I have been establishing essentially the ideal field, um, field setting to ask these questions. We've been working in the same embayment in the Bahamas for the last 10 years, and we've constructed 35 different reefs on which we have temporal data for each of those reefs. And so each of these points represents a different reef the different colors represent different projects. And we also have data on some of the patch reefs throughout this area. So the idea is to use telemetry and monitor the movement of a suite of species and a suite of individuals within those species to understand how they're moving and distributing nutrients and energy across this broad area where we have knowledge of certain, of certain components of this area. So essentially, we're, we're developing a pretty good understanding of this feedback but again, what we really don't understand is how fish are moving nutrients to or away from these feedbacks. And so this provides a really ideal context with which to ask this question. And this would be the, the data that this, this research would produce would be really, uh, really useful in, ter in terms of helping us understand more about theory, but also useful in terms of applying it towards conservation. So in terms of theory, it would really provide a, a substantial data set with which to test um, assumptions about meta-ecosystems theory, but also to help us understand better the role of biodiversity and individual specialization in mediating these processes spatially. Keep doing that. Uh, in terms of conservation, this would provide a really key piece of information to help us understand if and to what degree artificial reefs are actually enhancing localized fisheries production. And this could be a really big deal if we could start quantifying this then we can really start using it as a tool, particularly in places like Haiti, but really anywhere in the Caribbean, to potentially enhance localized fishery production. But also because we don't know a lot about just the sort of basic natural history of many of the species within these ecosystems, this would provide a really uh, a lot of important data about the potential for uh, these fish species to spill over from marine protected areas 
potentially moving away from these areas. But again, we really don't know how these, these, fish, these species um, move within these ecosystems. So that's one key area that I'm particularly excited about pursuing given a position within this department. But there's lots of other areas that I would, I'd be excited about pursuing. Um, I mentioned this research in Haiti um, and, and thinking about these sort of bigger picture que questions and collaborative questions about integrating ecology and human behavior uh, because we've got such a great sort of um, structure set up within that area. But I also want to highlight the potential for this sort of research program we're developing in Haiti to, um, to be of use for students here at U of, U of M. So I think there's a lot of potential for um, developing field classes in areas like Haiti or even the Bahamas where we can bring students down to that area and expose them to these conservation issues in first hand. But I also think it could be a really uh, unique opportunity to be able to bring students from Haiti back to places like UM to provide a lot of the education that they don't have. One of the main things that Haiti needs is education. And I think that at a big university like this, we could potentially provide that, that really needed component to these sort of underprivileged people. Um, I mentioned only briefly this research that I'm conducting using salmonid um, variation of behavior to test river restoration efficacy. This is a pretty cool, interesting um, set of research we're doing. I'm working with a ton of managers. And we're able to address some really interesting questions. But it's, some, some, an area, it's an area that I would be really excited about pursuing, but also bringing some of those ideas um, directly to these ecosystems here locally, trying to understand the role of sort of individual level variation and how things like uh, lake eutrophication or restoration may be affecting these variations and using them as a tool to understand um, these, these uh, anthropogenic changes to the landscapes around here. There's a, one reason I would be excited about this is because we have, you all have such a substantial um, sort of support group of, of research areas around here, including the UM um, Biological Stations and the Edwin S. George Reserve locally. And I think it'd be great and exciting to get some local research because it'd be an awesome way to engage students, in particular undergraduates, and have access to these field sites so they can get firsthand experience going into the field and also, um, also potentially doing, conducting some lab work. So I want to bring it back to this slide um, because I've shown you all today that we're sort of developing a general understanding of these processes that, that really are helping us understand how these emergent properties are arising within these marine ecosystems. But it's, it's important that I'm, I'm trying to link my research with respect to theory such that it can also provide us a better understanding of how these processes and these properties emerge across ecosystems in general, beyond those of just marine ecosystems. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisors. Um, funding is obviously very critical and tons of logistic support that takes place in the field. And I will take any questions. I'm going to... Uh, I like Jake to field his own questions, but I did want to, to see whether or not the, the folks at Varsity Drive can hear us. Is anybody there at Varsity Drive? They may not have heard us because the microphone went. Yeah, sorry about any uh, <laughs> snap news there. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's stick to the, the questions and I'll let uh, Jake field the questions. Yes. I am. I'm concerned more for the people that are getting trashed by it. But yeah, it's a it's a big deal. The the, the graph of the image that I showed with the stars uh, in the Caribbean, the the hurricane pretty much started at point at the lowest star. It, that was the first place it hit uh, in Haiti. I just got an email from a colleague down there. He said that the entire island where we work is pretty much level. So it looks like the casualties are, are low, which is good, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. I, I mean, our reefs, I don't know, they're, they're built strong, but hurricanes can move ships that are sunk, so I don't know, we'll see. It, I've had a few hurricanes hit a few of my reefs and they've done okay, but it's all, you don't know, surge and there's all kinds of factors, so I'm just kind of, I'll, I'll probably be going down there pretty soon, <laughs> so not good. <laughs> 
some fish and uh, really, really wonderful by What is it just what's fishy cool like? Yeah, um, so yes, we do have an idea of the super peers. There's different uh, super peers for P and super peers for N. The super peers for P are going to be the, the top predators because they're, they're feeding on the highest quality resources, and that's more phosphorus rich. So a, a bony fish has lots of phosphorus in it, and so that top barracuda is going to be excreting a lot of phosphorus. Um, with respect to nitrogen, it's, it's metabolic based. And so actually per body size, the littlest guy is going to be peeing the most per unit body. But in, in that sense, beyond that, just the largest individual is going to pee the most. So it could be the biggest parrotfish. Um, could be the, so it's the largest body size with respect to nitrogen. But within individuals, it's, uh, the work I'm doing now in the Pacific, um, we're doing another fish pee beta, data set, which is kind of like fish pee. I've been doing a lot of fish pee lately. Like, all right, enough. But um, we decided to zoom in instead of just doing collecting everything um, this year we're focusing on um, a few in a few species and doing a ton of individuals within those species and so we can look at if there's super peer individuals but also we can relate it to things like body psychiatry isotope data so for each individual we're collecting a ton like i think it's 12 different parameters but we're collecting between uh, 20 and 65 of individuals of 18 different species, I think, is what we got up to. So we can have this massive data set to ask questions about that, but it's more sort of honed in on within species. But it's a good question here. Yes. Um, uh, the living animals, what they're experiencing, what they're doing, what they're doing, what about death mortality? The mortality is where, um, I mean, other are there any death where are carcasses falling around these final species, which um, hotspots? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. Uh, kind of no. I mean, things just, it's a, it's just the system just teams. So if something just croaked in mid, mid water column, it would just get scarfed up, basically. I mean, it's amazing. It depends on the system, right? But you don't ever see a dead fish land on the ground. I mean, that's for sure. So. Uh, it has to happen, right? I mean, a grouper, a big old grouper goes into his little hole and croaks and slowly gets eaten. So that definitely happens, and it and it matters. But I think it, the the rate at which it's it goes is is quick. Whereas, like in contrast, you have whale falls in the middle of the ocean, or a whale fall could could die because they they migrate to the tropics. A whale falling just off of a reef that's a big deal, you know, because it's a huge body and a huge you know biomass. So it's a different dynamic in that sense, but yeah. Well, the fish biodiversity is a big component of your whole, whole framework here. And focus is so far it's been on the Caribbean where fish diversity is relatively low compared to the Indian region. Yeah. Do you have any, how many, from your work, do you have any speculations about what might be the difference in the Indian Well, I mean, that, as I was saying, we're, we're now starting some work in Morea. Um, so it's pretty interesting to get out there and be like, whoa, there's a lot of species to catch here. Um, you know, I, I kind of know uh, because it's, I think functional group is really important within this context. I think you're going to see small scale variation within species, but in terms of what you're feeding on, that's going to be a really important driver on the ecosystem scale. And so the zooplankters, I think, are going to have a pretty similar role of within that. But that's a really, but that's part of what we're trying to get at. So within the data set I just explained, we chose a few individuals within each of a few functional groups, and we have a huge span. And so we can look at that and see like, oh, all right, so how much this fish eats zooplankton, this fish eats zooplankton, how much difference do they make on an ecosystem scale in terms of their turnover? And, and we have, we'll have data on, again, body stoichiometry and, and excretion rate. So it's a great question, and that's sort of one we're going after, because who knows? I mean, there's a ton of apparent redundancy in those those systems way more than even in the Caribbean, which is super diverse. Um, so it's a great question. Yeah. 
Right. So you, the question was how, how important did the fish be if you're sitting on that edge where the competitors could come in? So we actually think that they would be important for the competitors. So we have a paper out that's, that's sort of bringing in the idea that the fish may maintain the steady state. So if you have an algal dominated reef, the fish are, dominate, are, are maintaining the algal dominance through that, that particular mechanism. There's also the top down mechanism that, that is a different story and difficult to, to tease out. Um, but you know, I, I would argue, especially with algae, because they tend to be more plastic with what they can take. If they're there, they're going to do well if fish are, you know, in on it, essentially. Um, whereas coral are more sensitive. But it's something we're actually looking at testing um, using sort of an interaction of coral transplanted with macroalgae on our reefs in Haiti right now. It's a, I'm working with the students. Uh, we're kind of designing an experiment with that. So it's a great question because it's all about that that steady state thing where you see those shifts and it's, they seem to sit in that algal shift and it's so hard to get them out of that, that algal state. Um, so we don't know. It, the problem is the coral just seem to die no matter what right now. There's a few cases where they're resilient. There's an awesome uh, report just in uh, New York Times, that was the first place I saw it, it was kind of funny, but showing a, a total recovery. They expected it to be blasted by the heat wave in the Pacific and it's just teeming and doing great. So you love those examples, but Yep. Yep. Yeah. So we worked a lot with lionfish um, in terms of uh, sort of trophic uh, interactions, and they're phenomenal predators. Um, and measured their excretion, and it's it's not. In the sense of like the whole community, it's not, it, it doesn't really send a signal kind of thing. You don't really see it at the ecosystem level. They're there. Um, the turnover is interesting about those though. I think that would be a, what, if I were to address that further, their consumption rate is phenomenal. Like I've killed hundreds upon hundreds of those things and you almost never kill them and gut, we got everything we kill, we gut to see what it's eating. And you almost never find nothing in its stomach. Whereas if you killed a hunter grouper, you'd find you'd be lucky to find ten with something in its stomach. The lionfish, it's always going to be ninety, you know, and it's insane. So the consumption rate and getting kind of fluxes would be really where it'd be interesting with those guys. But a lot of the stuff I talk about is snapshot stuff. And so it's you know they don't store a ton and they don't particularly excrete a ton, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it's a good question though. They're really interesting. Last question. Yeah, no, it, it is totally possible. You can you can track it uh, to some level with uh, N15, with the isotope, nitrogen isotope. But these systems are, this system, that system, is, uh, there's no, run, well, first of all, there's no rivers in the Bahamas, so we don't have to worry about that as a source of pollution. There's some housing for sure, but this is in the middle of an abatement that doesn't have any development around it. So we, so what we do is essentially we compare it to the control, which is that, that, that spot that we've got a GPS mark on it in the middle of nowhere that's far away. And and so that's the only source of nutrients that can be there relative to the fish. Does that make sense? So we have a we have a reef, and we have fish aggregating around it, and then we have a control spot where there's there's no there's no reef, and we sample the seagrass there, and we we make the assumption that, that those nutrients are coming from the fish. You, you, you can see a signal with the N15 to some degree. 
but there, there's also just no major input of nutrients to these systems beyond the broad, you know, there's some coming in from the mangroves, there's a little bit coming in from the ocean, but that's affecting everything at the kind of level. That's a good question. Well, let's thank Jake one more time for this Thank you. Thank you. It's a little um, complication there. Well, I don't know what it was a big clicker. That just happened to be crazy. Yeah. Well, we'll um, you seem to be focused on macro 